Hi, everyone, and welcome to our March webinar. We appreciate you joining us today. My name is Erin Bremer. I'm a graduate assistant for the Zare Institute. I'll get us started by going through our agenda. Our host for today, Jonathan Swartz, will begin by introducing our guest speakers, giving us a little bit of background about them and their work. As I'm sure you're all aware, the topic for today is towards a relational masculinity, restorative justice in response to sexual harms perpetrated by male identified people. We wanna note that everyone speaking will do their best to communicate in a manner so that you all can follow along, but please comment in the comment section of whichever platform it is that you're using. If you have any difficulty with understanding our guest's conversation or technical difficulties, Following the discussion, there will be time for our guests to answer some questions from you all, moderated by Jonathan. And finally, I will briefly share a bit about our April webinar and give some closing announcements. Uh, as always, you'll be able to access the recording of this webinar via the Zare Institute's website and YouTube channels. Um, the recording will be uploaded by the end of this week so that you can return to it or share it with others. Thanks again for tuning in. And now Jonathan's going to introduce our guest. Thank you, Erin. We're really excited uh, to have a number of colleagues uh, and friends uh, today as our, as our guests. First, I want to introduce Kate. Kate Crozier is the Director of Programs at Community Justice Initiatives, where she oversees programs that use restorative justice values and practices to address the impacts of sexual harm as a community-based reintegration support from a women's prison. Kate's approach to restorative justice has been informed by her previous decade of work in the feminist anti-violence sector. Welcome, Kate. We're looking forward to hearing more from you. Next is Carol Bilson. Carol uh, is a Latina, Latinx, um, Mapuche, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese from Walmapu, Chile, and currently a PhD student in the program Social Dimensions of Health in the School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria. She has held the position of Alt Justice Coordinator at Victoria Sexual Assault Center and Education Coordinator at the Victoria Women's Transition House Society, where she trains staff, volunteers, and fellow service providers on the issue of intimate partner violence and trauma-informed practices. Carol further facilitates cultural safety workshops, co-creating decolonial futures, supporting organizations to work in more collaborative and relationship with the years of experience in community education and has developed multiple community workshops on decolonization, anti-racism, and spent men's wellness, healthy masculinities, and prevention of gender-based violence for boys and male youth. Welcome, Carol. Looking forward to hearing more from you. Next is Sarah Scanlon. Sarah is the Associate Director of Sexual Violence Response at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Canada and is adjunct faculty in the Masters of Restorative Justice program at Vermont Law School. Sarah has 15 plus years of experience in gender justice work. Sarah, we're looking forward to hearing more from you. And last is Jude Uchorn. Jude is a professor in human services at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Canada, with 15 years of experience doing restorative justice work in the area of sexual violence. He is the co-author of the little book of restorative justice for sexual abuse. In a second here, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to our wonderful guest for, uh, for conversation. A note to um, a reminder for those of you watching, um, watching this live, we want this to be interactive. We want to be able to hear from you, your comments, um, your questions. So please feel free to add comments and questions um, in the comments section of the platform that you are watching from. And I think we've got the sound, um, the sound issues taken care of now. So um, hoping for the hoping for the best on that. But I am going to sign off for right now and let our wonderful guests have their have this conversation.
Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as we move into the space together today, we wanted to create an opportunity for us to be uh, collectively in recognition and in relationship with ourselves, the land, and also the stewards of the land. So I'm gonna invite folks to um, take a moment to drop into your body um, in whatever way feels okay. For lots of us as survivors, being inside of our body doesn't feel safe. There's very valid reasons for that. So figure out how to like orient yourself into this space in a way that feels safe uh, for you. Um, I'm going to put my feet flat on the ground so I feel a connection to the ground below me. I'm going to allow myself to drop my weight into my chair, uh, feel my body weight sink a little bit. I'm going to drop my gaze or probably close my eyes on and off, um, just making sure the tech stuff is also going fun. And I invite you to do the same, either closing your eyes or just softening your gaze. And what I want to invite folks to do is take a moment to just pay attention to your breath coming in and out of your nose. Don't try and change the pace, just allow your breath to happen. Now, if you can, I get you to take a breath through your nose for the count of four. Hold for the count of seven. And exhale through pursed lips like a straw for the count of eight. And one more time, inhale through your nose. Hold and exhale through pursed lips. Now what I want everyone, I want to invite everyone to do is to picture your favorite body of water. That could be a pond, that could be a creek, a river, a lake, an ocean. And I want you to bring yourself within your sensory experience to that space. Bring yourself in relationship to that space. And so I want you to go through your senses of thinking about what are you feeling in that space. So starting with when you look around yourself, what are you seeing? Maybe it's sunshine, you know, hitting the water. Maybe it's waves. Maybe it's rocks on the shoreline. Moss. Little squirrels running around. Next, paying attention to what you feel. So maybe it's the sensation of grass under your feet or hot sand, the wind against your skin, the sun on, on your face. Next, what are you hearing? Once again, is it sound of birds? I hope so. Is it waves? You know, is there kids playing in the distance? Next, paying attention to what do you smell? You know, maybe it's earth and soil or salt water. Tuning into that sense. And lastly, what do you taste? Maybe you just had some apple juice. <laughs> Okay, now just sitting with those senses and being present with this body of water, I want you to think about what about this body of water feels so special or important or calming and safe for you? What brings you to this space? What invites you here? What invites you back here, maybe over and over again? And I want you to offer appreciation and recognition for this body of water in the ways that it has held you or cared for you or been a, a site for, to bring you back to yourself. Be in appreciation with it. And now I want you to think about the stewards of that land the indigenous peoples who have acted as land defenders, as water protectors, have put their time, their bodies, their energy, their love on the line in uh, relationship and solidarity with that body of water on that land. Who are those peoples? And just spend a little bit of time thinking about what do you know about what 
water protection or land defense looks like in that area. Thinking about ways that you could be in solidarity with them if you aren't already, or if you are of those <laughs> of that community, um, you know, offering and paying attention and, and tuning into that massive amount of, of labor and love. And just offer a moment of, of recognition, of prayer, of thanks to the peoples that have protected that water, that water so you can enjoy it, so we can stay safe and hopefully clean, connected to that land. Maybe offer a prayer, put down some sema, take a moment. And think about ways that you can, after this webinar, be in solidarity with them. We were talking about uh, gender-based violence, about land. There are so many different important intersections between violence against the land and violence against women's bodies. There's so much work being done on that by Indigenous feminists that you can follow up on. And thinking about where are the origins of our consent practices coming from? They come from colonial relationships to land that we got taught as children about power over, about entitlement. There's so much in learning here that is deeply connected to gender-based violence work. What does solidarity look like with the water protectors and land defenders who are holding that water? And last, I want to do a scan back in recognition that the not in my backyard is still white supremacy, it's still colonialism, recognizing that the water that is uh, in the area I'm in currently, Bracebridge, Ontario, the beautiful river that I'm on uh, outside of the space I'm in right now, um, it's connected to the water where Carol has chosen is thinking about, it's connected to um, the water um, on the shore of Gaza. Um, where those trees are being cut down as a part of colonization. Um, it's connected to the waters that all of you in this space are holding space for and thinking of and honoring. And so just remember, this is all a part, a part of a movement of connection to each other and has to be in deep relationship. Okay, just take one last moment of connection to your, your body to the space you're in, to the water that you brought yourself to and are in appreciation of, and then thinking about what it does it mean to be in a broader relationship to all the land and water and the connection between destruction of land and water and destruction of gender-based violence. And I'm gonna get us to take another breath, breathe in through your nose, count of four. Hold. And exhale through pursed lips. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Um, yeah, for being present with us, for trying to create an intentional conversation on this stuff. Judah's going to be doing an opening for us, but I want to just take a moment to recognize that this stuff is extremely heavy. Talking about gender-based violence is extremely heavy. Um, we all have really different relationships with gender and sexual violence, and we're going to be talking about the people who cause sexual harm and our commitment to stay in relationship with them. That is really hard and messy stuff that is really activating for many of us, in particular for survivors. If you are feeling activated, we encourage you to take care of yourselves, drink some water, go for a walk reach out to someone you feel supported by, collective care always. But then also you can reach out to RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, um, to their hotline to check in with someone and access support if that feels useful for you. And I'll be throwing that um, support line into the chat box. And I'll leave it to you, too. Thank you very much, Sarah. And welcome, everybody. Welcome. We are thrilled. We're honored to be with you today. And I wanted to begin by saying thank you actually to my colleagues here that I'm presenting with Kate, Sarah, Carol. It's been a, an honor to work together with you and to begin uh, this journey of sharing more about accountability work. And we're excited to share with you. We, we've titled the webinar for today Towards a Re Relational Masculinity. And that's really important to us because we have a, a crisis of masculinity, a crisis of toxic masculinity and male violence in our communities. 
men who are individually and system, systematically abusing power and violating other genders and each other. Uh, men living out or performing a toxic version of masculinity that equates gender with violence, sex with conquest and relationships as being about domination and subordination. And as a result, sexual violence is epidemic in our communities. And although not exclusively, it is mostly men who are perpetrating it, which should tell us something about how masculinity is constructed in our communities, about how boys and men are socialized, about how men and boys are raised in our community and, and why our responses to male violence need to counter that socialization. And we need to develop new processes of nurturing boys and men and fostering them towards a more responsible agency. And in the mix of all of that, we have further violence. We have our criminal punishment system, which is responding to about 6% of those cases. And yet we know where it does respond, it tends to criminalize based on race, class and struggle. So for example, where I'm situated in Canada here on the land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the neutral peoples where I'm at, this has meant mass incarceration of indigenous peoples and grossly disproportionate rates of incarceration for black folks, especially young black men. The criminal punishment system in these instances is actually functioning as it was created to colonize indigenous peoples and to place black people into bondage to enforce white supremacist, patriarchal, racial capitalism. And further, if we're going to use punishment as our means of doing consequences, it's often count a counterproductive way to bring about change using the patriarchal and colonial dynamics of power and control, domination and submission to force men to stop using power and control and domination and submission. I've often said that the best metaphor that I can come up with for the prison system after working in it for about 20 years is that uh, essentially it's like an abusive father. So we're using toxic, violent masculinity to supposedly change toxic, violent masculinity. We're caught up in, in an, a needless, unnecessary cycle of violence. So restorative justice has somewhat entered the picture within this context, claiming to be able to address the needs of those who've been hurt while supporting people to be accountable in meaningful ways for the harm they've caused for those who voluntarily choose to engage with restorative justice. But if restorative justice is to be used in response to sexual harms perpetrated by male identified people, and we will share about instances where we're using it in our work, we need to be asking, how do we recognize the ways that toxic masculinity shows up within restorative justice processes, responding to experiences of sexual harm? What is important to consider when walking alongside men and masculine folks in their process of taking accountability for causing sexual harm? So we're going to start to answer those questions today, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of what we're thinking about. Obviously not complete answers, but conversation starters. And we're actually calling our approach a, a kitchen table approach. You're going to see the four of us on screen having a bit of a conversation rather than PowerPoint slides. And we get the sense that uh, we're actually at a large uh, kitchen table as it, it, we've heard that there's over 180 people who've signed up. So welcome to the banquet table. We sort of imagine maybe there would be about a dozen or so people interested in this conversation, but thanks to the hundreds of you who are actually interested in this, which we actually find very exciting because we need more people within, within this movement. So here's how we've structured our conversation then. First of all, we're each going to take a couple minutes to introduce our ethics or our journey of what brought us to that work. Next, after that, Kate and Sarah will share a little bit more about some of the practices that we're using in accountability work with men who've caused sexual harm. And then after that, Carol and I will share some of our ideas for a vision for, for the future in this work. And if we, if we have time, we have a brief little exercise at the end, and then we will follow it up with a, a question and an answer period. And then finally, Sarah will leave us with some resources. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you for being here and over to you, Carol. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Carol Dilson, and I'm coming to you from the unceded homelands of the Wissanich, Songhees, and Esquimalt nations on the west coast of Canada. Um, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and um, I come from um, the people in the Andes. Um, I'm an exiled person um, from Chile, and um, I also have Indigenous ancestry. And so um, my work is really informed um, by those two foundational experience of American imperialism and, um, 
and the colonization of our lands and and also having real um, I always say is the, my first abusive relationship was with the state and so when um, you come from folks that have this experience a foundational experience of exiled and indigenous and indigeneity um, we have a profound understanding of what systemic failures mean and that means what happens when the police uh, when the military, when the state becomes your primary um, perpetrator of violence and abuse? And what does it mean when you can't go to the police? And so this is um, a foundation to um, how I came to the work in terms of um, the ideas that drove me to, to start looking at sexualized violence in a different way that started to look at who we weren't having these conversations with, who was, who wasn't at the table essentially at the time. And, um, and what do we do when we're deeply suspicious of police and institutions? Um, so major um, mentors and guiders of my work. Um, I'm just going to name them so folks have a context, but uh, Bell Hooks, Brian Stevenson, Danielle Sird, and Vicki Reynolds have profoundly formed the my concepts of how I come to this work. Um, as a cis woman, I also understand that um, I'm surrounded and deeply motivated by um, feminism and feminist practice, but not it's particularly I want to name that it is Black feminism that has been the the leading force for me in terms of understanding how a first of all feminism is for everybody as Bell Hook says and then as Kimberly Crenshaw kind of nuanced that yes and we all don't experience the system in the same way so understanding that um, intersectionality often gets kind of pushed into a corner of just listing a list of identities, but that doesn't lead us into action. And so we really, I love it to see it move into a place of our collective struggles versus our, our intersecting identities that we have uh, around uh, vulnerability, especially in the face of the state. So if we are disabled, if we are black, if we are poor, if we are uh, brown, if we um, are HIV positive, if we, um, all of these things, while important how the system navigates us, they need to move into points of action and where we collectively struggle um, towards um, creating a more liberatory society. So I just wanna say in 2013, I came to work at the Sexual Assault Center at the University of Victoria, right out of my master's. And I got the opportunity for the first time we had um, some male students cause sexualized violence on our campus. And I did a couple of bit of research in terms of where do um, where did we start? And our sexual assault center was opened in 1997. What was the rates of students experiencing sexualized violence? And by 2013, when I had looked again at the research that had opened um, the assault center, we basically were experiencing the same amount of volume in terms of um, instances of sexualized violence on our campus. So to me, that spoke to two critical things. Um, we are not talking to the people that are primarily causing this harm. We have no services, we have no conversations, we have no brochures, no pamphlets. We didn't have anything directing uh, towards the folks that had been primarily the source of this violence. And then um, my second thing was is like, our strategy for the anti-violence sector, at least in Canada, had basically done nothing um, to reduce the numbers of incidences. We had created a lot of supports. We had created sexual assault centers, police liaisons, court supports, but we hadn't we hadn't reduced the numbers in any way. Um, and so now we're looking at 50 years of, re of research in Canada that, that indicate the same situation that I saw and continue to see at our sexual assault center. But starting a support center for men, um, sorry, a support circle for men at the University of Victoria, which I started when we started to work with these men, um, for me was something that I fundamentally came to understand that when you walk side by side with people that have caused harm, you start to recognize that they are definitely more than the thing that they did that brought you to that, brought them to you. Um, and all of us were so much more than the worst thing we've ever done as um, 
Brian Stevenson says. So um, I just want to talk about um, working with those men who cause sexualized violence on our campus, uh, made me understand and look for their humanity. And it also made me understand that our humanity was connected uh, directly to how we treat those who are broken, who are disembodied from their own humanity, and um, who have been deeply impacted by the colonial narratives of patriarchy and white supremacy. So I started to pay attention to the suffering of men. I started to pay attention to how patriarchy had kind of sold them a fake bill, you know, of this faux power. But to have that faux power, you had to cut off a very vital part of your humanity. And so you were allowed a lot of access to external status and um, outward, outward facing power, but you had no connection to yourself and you had no connection to others in terms of relating and the relationality that we held with others. So for me, this work is deeply understanding our humanity depends on everyone's humanity. We don't get to evolve as human beings as a collective until we start caring about everyone's humanity. And for me, the antidote to this violence is relational connection. So to me, the antidote to sexualized violence is starting to get into relation and connection with these men. And the reality is that we live in a society of white supremacy and colonial capitalism, and none of those things have either create the conditions or will create the conditions for us to start caring about each other and learning how to relate to each other. So as we work to change these, nen these patriarchy and these gender expectations, we're actually really also looking to change the systems that we live in. So um, I'm going to leave it there for my introduction in terms of how I got here. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Sarah. Is that right? Or are we passing it on to Kate? I'm totally cool with whomever. I think it's okay no matter what. Thanks so much for caring. Uh, well, caring, but also sharing, Carol. <laughs> caring and sharing. Um, yeah, I feel really excited to be able to share with you folks. Um, about this work and I feel really, yeah, passionate about the idea of having more people involved in this work. And I'm happy to share a little bit about kind of my journey to, to this work, uh, working with folks who cause gender-based violence, uh, in particular men. So I've been working in the movement to eradicate gender-based violence for about 20 years now as an activist, as an educator, advocate, counselor, et cetera. Um, I am a survivor of multiple forms of gender-based violence. And so primarily at my base core, I do this work from a place of deep solidarity and love for other survivors, both who I've worked with and who I've never met. Um, I also move through life with the acknowledgement that based on my past relationships with intimacy and alcohol, uh, primarily being in relationship with AFAB, so folks who are assigned female at birth, and also, when I was young, in my early 20s, in particular, poor consent practices, um, given that knowledge, I believe and come from a place that's a given that I've caused harm, particularly sexual harm, in some form um, in my life. Um, I also have a history with criminalization as a result of solidarity work and activism. Um, and those pieces help inform some of my perspectives on being a prison abolitionist and believing um, that we're all responsible for stopping our own patterns of harm and we really require community support to to do this and get there. Um, I've been learning within community accountability frameworks for about 15 years now. Um, most of the roots of this work for me come from transformative justice community and those who are working to support individuals who caused harm and taking accountability. And some of the origins coming from PAR, which is a program in Ontario called uh, yeah, the PAR program. Um, I first started learning about transformative justice through community activism from predominantly queer and trans and many of which black indigenous and racialized folks. My origins in these practices were not actually inherently connected to gender based violence work when I first started. I didn't see the connection about what I was learning from my friends and comrades uh, with an activist community about not relying on the prison and the state to respond to harm at the same time that I was working for a rape crisis center. And so I had already started my work around gender, uh, gender based violence work. Um, and I'd been doing actually work around uh, child porn and child luring and was really being confronted 
uh, with the atrocities of these types of harm. And then over here was was kind of like getting in the mess and trying to like figure out how does it how does it how do we not rely on these systems when harm happens? And I, I felt a disconnect for a while around those pieces. Um, in these spaces, in these activist spaces, we were kind of learning about how to respond when you have harmed someone and what does it mean to actually take good accountability. Uh, we were trying to acknowledge that for many people in our community, calling the police wasn't safe and we needed other options when hard things were happening within our communities. Um, and also where we talked about what it looked like to not mirror carceral systems within our communities and our relationship. To be totally transparent from my perspective, this one we failed a lot, but I think this is something that I hold as a base ethic. Like, how do I respond to the cop inside my head, uh, the the pull to be carceral that exists in my body that uh, because I was raised and I am continuing to be living in those systems that teach us that that is the right way we respond to harm. From my perspective, these practices that got taught to me in my early 20s were practices uh, that were basic day-to-day -day skills that were really about, they're about relational work, they're about taking care of ourselves and each other. Um, and most of us in those spaces were survivors. Um, alongside that time and as that kind of was progressing, I got more deep, deeply entrenched in gender-based violence work and I started, um, yeah, essentially what I call now is becoming a lifer in gender-based violence work and working alongside survivors um, and really seeing firsthand the ways in which the prison industrial complex was causing a lot of harm to survivors and their communities um, as survivors were seeking justice and how over and over and over again, they were experiencing so much harm and violence and re-traumatization um, or felt like they couldn't access these spaces at all because they were not built for them and for the needs they had. It was not actually a system that was responding to the needs that were emerging for their experiences of harm. Those were really valid needs to be tended to. Um, around this time, I started working uh, for a part program called Changing Ways. So I ran my first group working with men who had been charged with intimate partner violence and were court mandated to attend the 16-week group. Um, to be honest, starting working with men who engaged in intimate partner violence at 21 completely shaped my perspective now as a gender-based violence worker and someone who does restorative and transformer justice work, it shifted the trajectory of my perception of what was going to be required to eradicate gender-based violence in our communities and relationships. As Carol just said, like it shifted the recognition that we require supports, we need supports, we need counseling, but what are we doing about the root of the problems? Um, and having the opportunity to learn from mentors at that place in my life was life-changing and really uh, shaped really early on my ethics around this stuff in a way that at the time felt really like not welcomed within a lot of feminist gender-based violence communities. People were not really open to this type of work at that time. Um, it was seen as very separate from gender-based violence work. And so slowly over time of working and walking alongside survivors, navigating the prison system, I became a prison abolition feminist and started to explore the tools and practices in a much deeper way, um, offered through transformative justice, community accountability, and then eventually restorative justice. I see these frameworks and practices as tools to deliver us to abolition in a world without prisons. I see them as practices that we need to engage with on a daily, on a in a daily relational way, and when we respond to harm as a way to move us away from a carceral system. Um, and then that is like my broader framework. About eight years ago, there was an opportunity to start a sexual violence office at a university in my near near to my community at Laurier. And I, while I wasn't looking for a job at the time, I applied because I had this like vision of what does it mean to be like in a campus community where there's like a hub and I'd only done community work, but a hub of all these different re relationships and resources all in one place, what could it look like for us to actually uh, build those systems and build non-punitive responses and build responses that were adaptive and creative and responsive, to be honest, like literally responsive to the needs. And I felt like it actually might be possible to um, model and learn from some of the ways in which I have been brought up in community around this work. Um, and so I now have been at Laurier um, overseeing the sexual violence team for eight years, and we have a very robust restorative justice program, which I can talk a little bit about later. Um, as Carol kind of named, I come from a practice where it's important, really important to me to acknowledge where my teachings come from. Many of my lessons around uh, community accountability and gender-based violence come from, as I said, many 
uh, queer, trans, Black, Indigenous, racialized organizers, prison abolitionists, frontline workers doing accountability work with abusers um, within organizations um, and within community and in their own lives. So in particular, I just want to name Arthi, uh, Meta, Chanel, Giselle Diaz, who's a long-term mentor of mine, Tim Kelly, uh, Mohammed Bahaubaid, Darling Richter, um, and also my learnings and influence continue to come from being in different kinds of relationship with Giselle Diaz, Jasmine Mendoza, David Karp, Vicky Reynolds, Humera Jahaved, uh, these three folks, Carol, Duda, and Kate, and all of Kate's colleagues at Community Justice Initiatives, um, and Don McDermott. And most importantly, I just want to recognize that the majority of ways I learn about this work is from the survivors that I've worked with over the past 20 years and the survivors I work with every day. That, that is where I learn so much about, about healing, about justice, about uh, where we want to transform our worlds to be. And then just recognizing critical texts that inform my work is Mia Mingus, Rania Magamar, Mary Makaba, Shira Hassan, uh, Kai Ching Tom, Erica Miners, Adrian Brown, Beth Ritchie. That list could go on forever because I'm literally obsessed with reading. It's actually kind of like a joke with this group and beyond that every time we've been meeting, I'm like, have you heard this book? Um, but we'll share resources at the end. I'm gonna pass it to Kate. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Carol, who shared uh, before me. Yeah, I am sitting on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people, um, as well as, as Judah. I come from the violence against women sector, doing about 10 years of shelter work and sexual assault counseling, where uh, I'm just so grateful for how much I learned about intersectional feminism, trauma-informed practice, systemic barriers to safety, advocacy, risk assessment, safety planning, strength-based counseling, and group work. And in that environment, I experienced a ton of mentorship and felt very cared for working in that sector. One of my memories though, uh, of working in that sector is uh, doing counseling with women um, around sexual harm they'd experienced and wishing they could have the opportunity to uh, be in dialogue with the people who'd harmed them so that they could ask questions of them and um, share the impacts with them. And I remember at that time uh, dismissing that idea as just not being possible and doing empty chair exercises instead. I started to notice in my time there that where, where women were also causing harm, I saw a lack of congruence between the analysis we held for female identified survivors that was very highly trauma informed and those that we held for men who'd caused harm. Instead, we just openly referred to them as manipulators, predators, monsters. And my curiosity around that discrepancy is what led me to restorative justice. I came to community justice initiatives in 2012, and I came expecting to see things that I understood as critically important to just exist uh, and be quite similar. When I came, I didn't see a feminist framework in the sexual violence work that my team did, um, but I did hear of the word uh, carceral feminism for the first time. I didn't see an anti-racist, anti-oppressive lens. I heard nothing about patriarchy, nothing about racism or colonization. I heard lots about powerful transformations that happen in group, lots about um, the impact on individuals and the assumption that equity work was the result of what we did with individuals. It all sounded very suspicious and worrisome to me. So in my first few weeks here, I uh, was freaking out about where I just shifted my career to. And I remember drawing a Zen diagram, the two circles. And on one side, I had all the violence against women values that were the foundation of the equity seeking survivor driven work that I'd come of age with. And on the other was the values that I was learning restorative justice was centered in. And luckily in this exercise, I found some overlap located in that sweet spot in the middle. I wrote some core values that were shared. Sexual harm is wrong. We need to offer trauma-informed support, victim-centered support, that we can value narratives over legal definitions of harm, um, that this work can be done well by community. Professionals are, professionals are not required and police and courts aren't helpful most of the time. A caring, informed community is. So I pinned this diagram up over my desk and, and decided to get to work. I needed to learn everything about restorative justice that I could and needed to bring some humility to restorative justice. Um, there were, there's been major limitations and a lack of humility in this field. And I, I wanted to rebuild the sexual harm aspect of restorative justice in partnership with the critical analysis held in indigenous abolitionist and feminist circles 
especially Black feminist circles. Restorative justice in this way is still evolving. It's still a new practice. And I really get excited about uh, all the people that are invited to put their fingers on it and shape what it can be. I'm also a mom of two boys um, and watching one of them, you know, be infiltrated by really toxic uh, messages in his social media and watching um, the impact that has on him. Um, yeah, so, so lots of reasons I care about this conversation. Thanks, and I'll pass to Jude. Thank you. Love hearing your introductions. Yes, I mean, obviously the three people in, in the chat here uh, with me are people I look to and look up to. And it's it's nice for me to hear, once again, your ethics around this. Uh, I think for me, uh, there's sort of two ethics that, and I'll share how I kind of got to them. One is uh, an ethic of carrying my responsibilities and being responsible for my social locations. And I'll say more about that in a minute. And then the second one is just an ethic of care. I've, I've got deep care for myself, for my family, for my people, for my community. And I think my, what keeps me going in this work is I find a lot of meaning and a lot of satisfaction and actually a lot of joy uh, working with people too as, as we work towards kind of trying to structure our lives in a, in a more meaningful, more accountable way. So I, I, I kind of came to the work for, for two reasons. One is I grew up in family violence. And so being a survivor of family violence was kind of the way I described myself maybe about 25 years ago. That was kind of the primary sort of identity where I, I considered myself to be a survivor. And I am a survivor. I mean, I wouldn't diminish that. At the same time, one of the things I discovered along the way was that as a, a white male, uh, cisgendered person, my pathway to healing and recovery was it was pretty smooth. It was paved uh, very well for me. I had lots of access to resources. When I started seeking help, people were very affirmative and very caring and I, people didn't doubt my story. People didn't question me, all of that kind of stuff. And so I, I started to contrast my own growing up experiences with other people that I was meeting in prisons as I did restorative justice work. Often their stories also involved forms of trauma. But there was big differences between who I was meeting in pr prison and uh, and my own story. I was meeting people who were uh, abused by people who hoard wealth. So people struggling through poverty, people struggling through addictions. I was meeting indigenous, black and racialized folks. And I started to recognize that uh, pathways to healing are, are very different. Um, about the time I started to make some of these realizations, I was actually invited in by an indigenous elder by name, by uh, named Andrew Wesley in the early 2000s uh, to participate in some healing circles for indigenous res residential schools. Uh, and this this was kind of a life shifting experience for me where growing up we have we have stories that we we tell ourselves as Canadians about who we are and what we've done and it's a very white supremacist colonial benevolent type of story and it has diminished and dismissed the fact that we we have caused a lot of harm through colonialism and we continue to cause a lot of harm through, through colonialism the, the long story short of that was um, I started to engage more with indigenous peoples and build relationships and through that I started to learn that I actually have responsibilities to carry so as I think about toxic masculinity and patriarchy I, I often and say that not not every man is violent in interpersonal relationships but all men are responsible and so i think if it's primarily men who are perpetrating sexual violence then i have an obligation as a man to my community to work with other men to make sure that further violence isn't being perpetrated in my community. So that's what I mean by carrying my responsibilities. And, and then along the way, the, the care piece has really emerged for me. I don't know how to articulate it other than doing accountability work with men who've perpetrated violence is one of my favorite things to do. I, I get a lot of satisfaction and a lot of meaning out of it about having deep, difficult conversations that really challenge people about their choices and help them understand who they are as people. And, and then therefore, hopefully it translates into uh, to safer communities, more loving communities, more caring communities. So those are our, our brief introductions, our conversations about some of the ethics, some of who we are coming into this work. Um, oh, I guess I should also mention, uh, no, I will, I'll mention it later. I was going to mention some of the work I've also done in, in this, but I think we're ready to move on. Let's talk about, now we're going to talk about some of the practices that we're actually using in this work. And we're going to start with Kate on that. And then Sarah is also going to do some sharing. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to speak about this work in the context of a program at a not-for-profit organization. 
um, and uh, that program uh, is Revive, and it does both group work and dialogue work to support building accountability uh, for sexual harming behaviors and to meet the needs of survivors and others impacted by sexual harm. Uh, this work is unfunded, uh, and so this program is created entirely out of restorative justice principles for building accountability through a supportive context. A very important uh, practice uh, to us at, is that this work is done by non-professional community volunteers with high levels of training and support from CJI staff. We take the position against the professionalization of this work. What we're doing here isn't social work. Our volunteers undergo a large amount of training and then have a massive amount of support from the staff supervisors before and every group, uh, before and after dialogues uh, and case developments and, and all their meetings. And I can't stress enough about how this is an important ethic uh, in our model. Engaging volunteers means that we have survivors in the room, in our group facilitations and in our dialogue work as facilitators. And in fact, our facilitation team is often made up of people with previous experience of causing harm as well, who have moved through an accountability journey. It means that when survivors come to us for dialogue work uh, and ask for specific identity factors in their facilitators, we can likely meet that request. But it also allows us to maintain a grassroots connection to this work. While CJI isn't necessarily a grassroots organization, the way that we can build, tear apart, and rebuild our work, the way we can be creative and risk-taking is important to us. It allows us to protect over the institutionalization and elitism of professionalized social work, and we can more meaningfully promote social justice through advocacy and creative responses to the oppressive systems we bump into. And finally, it means that each person doing this work has a more realistic amount of work on their plate. Our staff are tasked with supporting maybe four to six volunteers and each volunteer is tasked with supporting a small handful of people. And so the, the level and the ask of where people's care needs to go can be really focused and not overwhelming. No one is drowning in casework. We just do our own piece. So in our group work, um, men come to our program in three ways. Um, they come pre-sentence referred by their lawyer, post-sentence referred by probation and parole, or more and more self-referred. So what is really promising is that we are uh, on occasion, certainly not flooded by it, but on occasion and increasingly getting calls from male-identified folks who recognize they have caused a sexual boundary violation, they've harmed someone sexually, and they uh, don't want to do that again. And they call and reach out for support uh, out of guilt and worry about what they've done and a desire not to harm again. So in our group work with people who've offended, we're really interested in exploring a few things. Um, do they recognize that they cause sexual harm? So in order to work through a restorative justice context, we need people to at least have the bare minimum recognition that harm happened and they have responsibility in that harm. It is rarely the case that people enter our organization with a full sense of accountability of what they've done. Uh, we often encounter people uh, who deny any harm happened. They say they've been falsely accused and we can't work restoratively with those folks. We're looking for some recognition and then to grow it from there. We're curious about to what extent do they understand the root cause and the impact of the harm they've caused? And can they be in a shared space with others who've caused sexual harm? We structure our conversations uh, with people who come to us through a trauma-informed lens because there's evidence that causing harm has a traumatic impact. And we know that people uh, aren't just harm doers. They've had lives before uh, the harm happened that often uh, can have a traumatic impact as well. We start with offering transparency around the purpose of our meetings and what we need to cover uh, before they start receiving services from us. And then we offer folks a choice on where they want to start. Do they want to hear about our program and values today and come back another time to complete the rest of the intake? Do they want to start talking about their strengths uh, and some of the supports they have in their life or things that are stressful for them now? Or do they want to rip the Band-Aid off and start with talking about what happened that led them to inquire about our services? I'm interested in hearing from folks about their early childhood experiences, including how and where they learned about sex. 
I'm interested in noticing to what extent they're open to being challenged by me about feedback I have on what they on, uh, how what they share lands with me. I'm interested in hearing to what extent they're motivated to contribute to group spaces by supporting and challenging other members. And I'm interested in what's currently going on in their lives that's challenging and helpful, you know, recognizing uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's in this intake and then through ongoing conversations and group work that uh, the tool that we've named accountability blockers arises. This means for sure we are hearing in conversation and in group work, denying, minimizing, blaming, rationalizing, intellectualizing, religiosity, uh, a case for hypersexuality, objectification, should statements, throwing in the towel and seeing themselves as the victim. And so this is the work that we, we do together. Upon hearing any of these accountability blockers, it's the work of the intake staff, the volunteer facilitators, but especially the other men that are in group with them to address what they heard. So in a typical group, men will have the opportunity to choose what they want to talk about, something that's going on important to them. Um, and it's in these conversations where these accountability blockers um, arise. And so group members are to, to challenge one another um, with what they've heard and invite the group member to reframe or take some time to think about the impact of that language and come back to group next week um, and to try again. Yeah, we, we aren't um, as interested in the intention of what they've shared, but the impact. In this eight month group cycle, each group member is asked to complete a peer review. And this is a tool that we've borrowed from the Ontario Correctional Institution and made it our own. Each group member is expected to sign up for one group session in the season and share their offending story with the group. The whole story, whatever's relevant, how they grew up, how they learned about sex, the attitudes they've held about sex, their pornography use, their first offending thoughts, their triggers, how their victims were impacted, and what their offense prevention plan is. Their fellow group members listen to this sharing, ask questions at the end, and then provide that group member with extensive feedback on how their sharing landed. What did they show a high level of understanding around? Where have they seen growth and understanding from that group member? What parts of their story did they gloss over or neglect to even address? Where did they maybe show a lack of understanding or empathy? Each year, um, they continue to re receive services with us. They have the opportunity to do their peer review again. That is uh, our group work in a nutshell. We also do dialogue work that we call facilitated dialogue. And this is distinct from mediation. It isn't resolving a conflict. It's a practice that's slow, centered on harm, uh, not conflict. It is generally addressing something uh, that's entirely shaped by the needs of the people participating. Um, While well, they generally follow a format of exploratory conversation, intake, case development and dialogue, each process is as unique as the participants. We at CJI have a survivor driven process. Um, so if someone has offended is reaching out to do accountability work in dialogue with a survivor, um, we don't proceed uh, by cold calling a survivor into that conversation. And if people are interested in how we proceed, I can talk about that in the Q&A later. In this work, we're interested in what does accountability mean to the survivor? Uh, it's a word we've equated with punishment in our society, but when we ask survivors, what does accountability look like? What are your healing needs? Um, we, hear, we hear a whole spectrum of other things. Sometimes we hear that a survivor simply needs the, the, the person who harmed them to admit it happened. We know that that denial of harm causes all sorts of secondary trauma. Um, that is uh, hugely disruptive to someone's well-being. And so that might be what this accountability process looks like. In that case, uh, we would have case development meetings with the, the person who offended and assess their capacity to admit that harm happens. And if there is an alignment, if we see that that person is able to do that, then we're going to proceed and we're going to prepare people for that dialogue work together. However, sometimes uh, what people want for accountability, what survivors want is, is different than that. They might need the person to admit what happened. They might have questions like, what were you thinking at the time? What have you thought about since? Um, have you harmed anybody else? 
what's your plan so this never happens again? And then we need to meet with the person who caused harm and to see to what extent are they able to respond to those questions. If they're not, if they are so far from being able to understand those questions, we are not going to bring those folks together in dialogue or we are going to replicate harm again. Um, so with the person who has caused harm, just like in our group work, it's very rarely ever uh, in a position to be fully accountable and answer in ways that are entirely informed and transparent. There is work to be done. And so we, we do reflection exercises. We have folks watch and read uh, content. And really interestingly, we now have access to people who will step in as surrogates. So CJI has um, volunteers with us who have lived experience of causing harm or being harmed who will step into dialogue in lieu of the um, actual person involved. So where someone has caused harm, they could uh, choose to have an uh, a dialogue with another survivor who's choosing to volunteer in that way um, to practice their dialogue. And this survivor can give them feedback on how um, their contributions landed. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and pass to Sarah. That's that's our practices in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Kate and I work closely together. So uh, there's a lot of like mirroring, actually, um, in some of our practices from when we actually do facilitate a dialogue for sort of justice processes. So I'm not going to go into those pieces because it would be a repeating. And, and I think that like folks who are like really embedded in doing work with folks who cause harm in particular men and are doing RJSV stuff have like, hopefully have some level of a similar framework when we do actual bringing people together as one of the goals. So I'm not gonna go into those pieces. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the frameworks and ethics around it that we use. And then some of the things that like a really alive for me when I'm trying to like be in this work. Um, I'm a talker, so I'm just gonna like put time on. So I'm paying attention to it because we are, quickly running out of time in this webinar and it's alarming me. Um, so one of the big pieces that me and my team do um, when and whenever we're working with an individual who's caused harm, regardless if they're going through a restorative justice process, you know, underneath the policy I oversee, we have informal intervention, we have adaptable resolution, restorative justice could be part of those or potentially couldn't be because as someone named in the chat, not always does the person who uh, experience harm want to be in these processes, but they do want someone to reflect on and engage in accountability um, and maybe not involving them at all. Um, and so one thing I can say is like an opening piece to understand like how we help support people in reflecting on kind of what pathway they're going down is in intake as sexual violence counselors on my team, we ask the question, what does healing look like for you? And what does justice look like for you? Those are two really critical pillars in our work. And so then when people are, it's how we essentially do our own needs assessment. And so then when people are thinking about justice and we're thinking about accountability and we are like listening and in, in, we're listening in their stories um, for these pieces of how we can have their needs met, how we can support having as many of their needs met as possible. Um, and sometimes that's a restorative justice. Often what we hear over and over again and Danielle Sarah's book, Until We Reckon, beautifully speaks to the needs across the board that survivors experience. I talk about Danielle Sarah's book until we reckon endlessly. So I'll probably mention it six more times, but um, what we hear over and over again from survivors is I really want him to have, uh, I want, really want him, because we're speaking about men in this case, um, to understand the impact that this had on me, the significant impact this had on me. And I want him to never do it again. And those two things happen over and over again, a, 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 a connect to larger things around safety and wanting to be able to tell their stories. And so, those two pieces really require the involvement of the other person. And so that's the case. Sometimes they want RJ, sometimes they want other pathways. One of the very first things that we do in our work with folks who cause harm is uh, we create space for grief. And so what I mean by that is that the majority of people we're working with who cause sexual harm are not predators. They've caused harm. They're maybe perpetrators. Maybe they have raped someone and they're rapists. Maybe they've caused other types of harm. There's lots of different language that survivors choose to use. Um, but the grief work, for me, coming from a background of folks who cause harm uh, within uh, who are court mandated to participate in stuff, grief work is such a critical first step. And what that looks like for me and my team um, is before we're really unpacking much of anything, we're starting to explore like 
what are the ways that these people are this person sees themselves the values they hold about themselves in their relationships and then the feedback they're getting from from this story that they've caused harm and where is the tension between those and what's the story they're creating about themselves in that tension in between and this there's so much grief in this work right there's so much grief in being told uh you raped me or you didn't hear my no or whatever it is that the person named to them and it is um in this current world, it is extremely disruptive to hear that when you think you're a good person because we don't have uh, the space and complexity often to be like, you can cause sexual harm and not be a complete monster who deserves to be kicked out of society in our community. That's like starting to be something we can talk about and talking about how common this is. And the reality is, is if we don't create more space for people to do that grief work, then they're not going to be able to sit with in a meaningful way because actually they'll just get defensive and the people around them are frankly encouraging them to get defensive, encouraging them to deny. Um, one of my earlier stages of work, I was working with a young group of boys who had been repeatedly causing sexual assault in a playground, like pretty brutal sexual assault in a playground, long time over six months. They were 11 years old and six boys were over and over and over again. It went to the police. The Crown had a moment of brilliance of being like, hey, maybe we don't put these like at this point, 12 year olds through a criminal legal process. Um, and so they brought me and a couple other folks into a year long program that we created with these folks. And the program was really cool and I'm really proud of it. And what we learned in that process is whenever there was gaps in the work, so like the holidays and they wouldn't, we'd miss them for a couple of weeks, they'd come back reverted because they were home with their parents and their parents part of them really believed those girls deserved it and wanted it and they were laughing for a reason like there's so much unworking that was happening within that process and so it really reminds me of like you know who else do we need to be talking to how are we building people's skills to as they work through their own grief then be able to talk to other people in their lives who are also holding grief about the, this person that they love causing harm um and so another piece that i think is really really critical um and I think is maybe the most critical thing we do. I saw someone's comment in the thing about like professionalization. I have like zero stake in the game of professionalization around restorative justice. I have a hundred percent stake in the game of doing your own self work. I think if you are going to do work with folks who cause harm, it requires a tremendous amount of self work, of reflection on your ethics, about your relationship to accountability and harm, about your own trauma, um, about about your own grief, about what your activation points are. This is really activating work. It's really challenging work. And I think we're, we required an internal accountability process and, and uh, a constant reflection of ourselves and people outside of ourselves to be going to, to talk through this work. If I didn't have a team of people, Vicki Reynolds says the team that you held the, at the moon with, I would not be able to do this work. And one other thing around toxic masculinity, um, as a survivor and as an AFAB person, but all of us, we need to be conscious about our relationship and trauma and relationship to toxic masculinity because many of us have a fight, flight, freeze and fawn, appease response to toxic masculinity. And that's where colluding with perpetrators can get really messy. It's really critical that we hold humanity for people who've caused harm. It's really critical. And it can get really messy if we're still, you know, we're always going to be unpacking our relationship with toxic masculinity. But like, if your response to men when they get angry or men when they get sulky or sad or cry is like a fight response or a fawn response, it's going to be really impactful in that process. And it can result in escalating and making things worse, or it can result in colluding with the perpetrator. And that appeasement fawn response in particular for survivors is something we need to be really conscious of because it's a survival strategy that's totally fucking valid. It's so valid and it can harm the process and it pulls us away from meeting the needs of the survivor. A couple of the things I want to say just around like grounding in ethics and modeling accountability, um, something that my beloved colleague, Carol Bilson, uh, said one time to me, which was keep a systemic view on it, even if it appears as an individual behavior. And it's something I always just like think back to myself of like listening in the narrative and the stories about um, like really listening in the in the narrative of the stories about where the other types of harms are happening. So, you know, when we do IPV work or gender-based violence or work, we're listening for like economic abuse, financial abuse, or uh, emotional abuse, physical abuse. We need to be listening for all those, but we also need to be listening for the how the systems are showing up, how systemic oppression is showing up and upholding these harms and giving permission for it. So thank you to Carol. Um, 
Adrienne Marie Brown talks about how important this work is as relational work. And she always says moving at the speed of trust. And I think that like, both as a counselor who does internal family systems work, as well as someone who does TGRD work, moving at the speed of trust is like probably one of my base frameworks now of like, most of us are traumatized and doing uh, trauma-informed work means recognizing that the majority of men we're working with experience trauma. People don't do this shit unless they've experienced trauma, period. Like I just like, that's a non-negotiable for me. And I'm not saying it's sexual assault. Um, I'm not saying that you know, they experience childhood sexual abuse, although there's high rates of that around people who cause harm. I'm saying that they have a relational trauma and we need to be moving at the speed of trust and not doing power over dynamics. Um, one thing that I think just, just for folks who are working within organizations or institutions is that something that my team does and we're really grateful for it because we have the resourcing for it as like a university with money um, versus a community organization is uh, we pair everyone who caused and experienced harm with counselors. So maybe they already have one of their own in the community, but in particular, when folks cause harm, we really try to be pairing them with an accountability counselor. Sometimes it's the same as a caseworker. Sometimes it's separate, depending on the, the breadth of the work that needs to happen. And in that work, Kate named some of that, so I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but there's a lot of psychoeducation around neuroscience of trauma and understanding how fight, flight, freeze is showing up in our relationships and our sexual relationships. We really believe in that psychoeducation being really important. And also this idea around uh, engaging consent and boundary practices Working with young people, which is like where I do the majority of my work now, I do external stuff as well, but the majority of my work is with young people and they just actually don't have good consent and boundary practices. They do not have skills in sexual communication. They don't have skills in rejection. It's actually pretty wild. Um, people are like, oh, consent is easy. It's not. It's clear it's not because they don't have it and they're trying to. And so one of the things that I actually have adapted is like a learning from this work, um, working with young people for eight years um, or working at a university for eight years, I should say, young people a lot longer, is that um, we stopped with our training of when folks are coming in for a first year. So before they get to our university, rather than talking about what is sexual violence, what is bias and intervention, we are now teaching before they get to Laurier, uh, module trainings, online module trainings about sexual communication, flirting and sexting in a healthy way, about boundaries, about apologies, about hard conversations and how our nervous system reacts to that, like base skills that none of these folks are coming in with at 17. And it absolutely is participating in creating rape culture. It is pulling us away from relational dynamics, from the, the dynamics that Carol was speaking about, like being in like loving, caring relationships. And then we're, we're like, like horrified by their behavior, but we all have a collective responsibility for these pieces. Um, I'm going to, I know I need to wrap up, so I'm going to stop, but what I'm going to say is one more thing. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of it and hopefully answer it during the questions is, uh, well, I'm really anti the professionalization of this work. I am. I have high concerns when it comes to risk assessment. And so that's a piece that I'm happy to try and share resources around. It is a piece I feel extremely nervous around um, because I do not think you can truly separate out most cases of sexual violence from intimate partner violence, stalking, harassment, et cetera. And lots of places are like, oh, we only do flat sexual assault cases. We don't do IPV. We don't do stalking. Um, I think it's complicated and much more nuanced than that. Um, and survivors who experience sexual violence within their relationships also deserve access to processes that aren't carceral, which means we need to skill up around what it means to be doing good risk assessment and good risk planning. Um, what does it mean when for an intimate partner violence relationship for the violence to have stopped, which is usually the base measure for most RJ processes, the violence has to have stopped. What does that mean in a long-term pattern of an abuse cycle? Um, you know, what are the risks there? And that's something I'm super passionate about. There are not a ton of resources out there about that, but I'm really into if people want to email me about that. Um, it's something that I think we all collectively, and I think if you're going to be doing uh, this work, um, you need to have someone that you're doing risk assessment work with um, and in particular, I think there's not enough understanding about how stalking is showing up in these types of processes and like the repeat harassment behavior. And stalking is actually one of the highest risk concerning uh, patterns of behavior within GBV. It is not recognized in that way. And a lot of people with untrained eyes would see it as like a sexual violence with a, some obsession stuff. And it's like actually very scary. We need to be really conscious of it. I still think we can use 
non-carceral response. I still think we can use RJ. I just think we need to be like really being realistic about it, having really frank conversations. And then the last thing on that topic is people also need to be trained in crisis planning. Um, I can see that Carly Boyce is in this conversation. Folks should check uh, them out. They're incredibly skilled at talking about suicide planning within community um, for like weirdos and uh, for the non-carceral lens, how to not call in the police. Because the reality is, is that so many perpetrators, so many men, when they find out they've, they've caused harm, are suicidal. Like it's almost every case for us. I, I swear to God, almost every case of a man who's caused sexual harm, when then they're confronted with it and we're doing that work with them, we're doing suicide assessment almost every time. And sometimes it's pretty dire. And so we need to be really responsible for that. And you need to make sure that the people who are doing those processes are equipped to respond to that. And they have their own support and accountability to be doing that work. It's really, really important. We An hour and a half is not enough time, people. Okay, go on to the next I'm going to um, piggyback off of that and go into a little bit more detail about who should be doing this work. And so I really want to thank Kate and Sarah for naming that that professionalization isn't essential to do this work, but very much factors in. So to me, um, our university considers um, educational processes and moves towards educating people out of this violence. And ultimately, I think um, we really have to, for folks who want to do this work and take up this work, the first journey is to really deeply understand your power. You have to understand your own, um, from your racial power to your ability, to your able-bodiedness, to um, your class power, to your um, all the, the the ways that the society gives you um, the cookies that it gives you, and recognize that you didn't do anything to deserve them, and you cannot. You, I always say, like there's a, a, a talk about cancel culture. And I'm always like, you can't cancel privilege. You can't. That is not something you get to walk away from. You will always have access to that privilege. So I think for folks who want to take up this work and understand this work, um, I always say, um, I'm a survivor of violence. And I work with men who who use young men who use this violence. In a, in a situation of navigating a conversation between um, someone who's caused harm I'm a racialized woman. I'm often working with white, uh, young, able-bodied men, and um, I still have the power to determine if they stay at this university or not. I still have the power to determine um, disciplinary processes. So while I'm socially um, out of my positions of power in that room, um, institutionally, I have to hold accountability to the power that I hold. And that's often, and it's in every single um, I think if two people get together, there's power in the room. Nobody walks into a room neutral. Nobody walks into a room with an assumption of benevolence. I think we have to hold the, the complexities that we all have the capacity to cause harm and we all have the capacity to do repair. Um, and so to me, um, when we think of the folks that are gonna do this work, not only recognizing the intersections of your own identity and how they hold and how they, you bring them into the room, how you recognize them and how do you mitigate them. And like Vicki Reynolds like says, how do you flatten that power and make it public? How do you make it an accessible and inform everybody of the, the position of power that you hold, which I think is fundamentally a practice of consent so that people get to choose whether they you, you are the safe enough person to share this work with. The biggest unlearning that I've had to do, which as Sarah's mentioned it as well, is the unlearning of my carceral mentality, the urge to punish, the urge to condemn, the urge to control, which is deeply rooted in like white supremacy. And, and we all know, especially as racialized people, ye who can perform white supremacy the best um, is the person who gets the most access to power in, in our society. So often racialized people have had to perform white supremacy much better or to a, at a higher rate and a higher de depth um, than than white folks themselves. And so uh, just really moving away from that urge to do that. People need to have the moral courage to unlearn their internalized violence and to really think about, um, thanks for mentioning this as well, Sarah, how we respond to men's 
uh, stress sweating? How do we respond to their um, literally in the rooms that we place them? Something that we literally came to learn in terms of just even bodily responses of men who are um, going through an accountability process. We are triggering a trauma response in them as well when we put them through accountability process or investigations or um, things like that. So how do we how do we respond to their trauma responses of being in these situations? How what have we done to hold their dignity and hold their safety as well in those rooms um, alongside our own? I really want to encourage, and I, I guess I'm speaking, I know this work is going to be done by multiple folks, but I really want to encourage, especially academic institutions who want to do this work, you can't educate someone out of these values. You can definitely use psychoeducational practices um, to inform their own um, narratives and their ideas and their values that have brought them to this. But the real work is that we have to connect on an emotional, on a nervous system, on a soul level, we have to witness each other and recognize that we are on this journey together. This is not about good people, the pure, the good, um, working with bad people, right? I, I often say when I'm in uh, conversation with men, you are not here with innocent people. You're not sitting across innocent people who are now here to condemn you. You're sitting along a peer who at one point also did not know um, how to navigate intimacy, did not know how to navigate consent, didn't know how to practice consent in good ways, did not know how to regulate rejection, did not know how to not project that into a self-hatred or a hatred of you for doing it. So first of all, understanding that um, the humanity that we have has to extend to the care of everybody in that room that is doing that process and that investigation. Um, this work is about developing a set of actions um, that are equal and opposite um, to the possible wrongfulness that was committed. And I always say like, your apology has to be as loud as um, the harm you've caused. So bring that same energy to the restorative process. And so um, it's an active exercise of power in the opposite direction of harm. And that's what makes it a healing process is that the work that we do with the men to get them to do that opposite, that opposite motion and to, or like Alan Jenkins says, to align them to their values that they see them in themselves, that they've named as their identity. How do we align them back to what they know? I, I get often, you know, Carol, I'm a good guy. I would never do this. Um, and so how do we align you back into that good guy narrative of yourself and your, and your understanding? Um, so just really, if this work, I can't re uh, emphasize it enough. If you are looking to do this work, the level of self-reflection you have to have on a daily practice, the solidarity team that holds you um, to your own accountability and to your own work is much deeper than I, I have to say for myself, at least when I was working with just strictly survivors, the level of reflection and um, unlearning I had to do on how I hold my own accountability, how I, how I double down on my own garbage, how do I, um, you know, just resist even when it's to the benefit of the community or to the benefit of myself even at the moment. And so it takes deep, deep active and reflective practices and a community of accountability to hold you to that. So do it in community always. This isn't an individual practice. You cannot, I, you know, due to neoliberal practices, universities will be like, okay, you're the one TJ person and you're the one holding these cases. This is a team of work. These, this needs to be done in teams. Um, this, this should not be doing one person because then that one person is often supporting the survivor and then supporting the person that's caused harm due to like lack of staffing due to like, um, and that's just not ethical. It's not only ethical, it's like we should be raising the alarms when institutions try to do TJ or RJ work this way. So um, I want to kind of wrap it up because we have the last just 10 minutes here um, about the vision. Um, so the bigger umbrella for me is how I see this is that we have to create liberatory masculinities. Women had the privilege and the struggle and the and the where for all and the 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 brilliant insight to recognize that the patriarchy was harming us all. But first, women started to, with the, the the feminist movement to liberate themselves from the patriarchy, and that is like 
you know, from starting from the 60s, like that era of feminist practice and the liberation of, of feminist movement created a capacity for women to be extremely feminine to extremely masculine. And at no point was their feminism or their women status ever questioned. Men did not have that uh, same um, by any means that same movement, and they have not liberated themselves from the, the, like the shackles of patriarchy. And so we have to get into proximity um, with the men and their healing. And that means not just like as um, we're addressing, a, a, I'm glad Sarah mentioned the, the all the other aspects, but what also we're seeing is, is like when men are having disordered eating, when men are um, struggling with depression, when men are struggling um, with poor self-image when high substance use is happening, especially at universities, um, just learning how to be a human being that self-manages. That's not something that obviously our society is training men up in, nor they're just training workers. We just want warm bodies to move through the, the create the machinery that's happening for us all. So to me, it's like, let's get into proximity with men's mental health and connect it to their ability to relate in good ways. We need to recognize and confront changing masculinity means changing a system. We're not just changing individuals. We have to recognize that we are literally by changing patriarchy, the, the goal will fundamentally and ultimately will lead to the change in power systems that we, and so the task I always see it as, yes, I'm working with this individual man, but my eye is always on the system. My eyes are always on recognizing how this, our systems are creating this particular type of masculinity. And recognizing that while the patriarchy harms everyone, it harms the men in a way that it truly disembodies them from their emotions and it ultimately their humanity. And a few things need to be inclusion. We need to start becoming more a more inclusive movement. Um, and recognizing that we're in relation. We're in relation with masculinity. And also men need to take more accountability for the accountability of men. So when we look, when we look further to upstream, we need to start streaming male counselors, male leaders, male workers into men's mental health and support. So while I deeply appreciate it, it is no accident that the, the majority of the folks you see on this panel are female, and femme identified or they thems and so it's to me it's like these are the these are the survivors of patriarchy and we are continuing to address this violence but we are not the folks that can reimagine masculinity we are not the folks that um can inform what this new masculinity we can't be world builders for a profoundly personal and intimate we can hold accountability we can ask for a relationality but that isn't our work and this is why it's like we're well structured to 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 navigate men into this field so we need to connect more men who care, like folks like Jude, um, into spaces and into collaboration with the anti-violence sector so that we can start working together. We need to collectively work towards creating processes that hold men's dignity and humanity at the center while doing the hard work of dismantling the harmful narratives and the gender expectations that, imposed, are, that are imposed on by the patriarchy in an, in an effort to liberate us all. We have all consumed patriarchy in some level of another. We We've all consumed this power over. We've all consumed this status seeking at, at everyone else's cost. Um, so um, to finish, um, <laughs> Vicky says, we are in the, Vicky Reynolds says, we're in the process of world making. We cannot be in a crisis of imagination right now. We may not know exactly what accountability is and we not may like not have a perfect definition but we do need be we do need to be able to imagine a world where we're not putting people in cages for social harms. That's what I do understand. That's what I do believe in. Um, just to finish off with like a, in BC, we did a we do training on traumatic brain injury through domestic violence and how brain injuries impact um, survivors. And when they looked at the prisons, 80% of people in prison in BC have a traumatic brain injury. So to me, when we're sitting here and we're incarcerating this many people, couldn't those be centers of support? 
couldn't those be centers of restorative justice? Couldn't those be used in that resource be used in a, such a better way than putting people in cages? So this is why I take up the work of RJ uh, the, and deeply hold it for uh, our humanity, our collective humanity is to no longer police people and incarcerate people into these, into social relationality. That's just, it's, it's counterintuitive. Um, I'd like to thank you. That's it for me. I'd love to, Jude, I don't know if you want to wrap up with a, a final reflection on our slides or, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carol. I actually just want, I'm just going to pause 10 seconds of silence here just to kind of absorb. I feel like you've cast a really beautiful vision for us and I just want us to like rest with it for a minute. Adrian Murray Brown talks about visioning, like finding a North Star. And I think in a lot of ways, you've given us a North Star. Uh, I think, uh, Carol, you you are the North Star, actually, in a lot of ways as well, too. I, I firmly believe that as a, as a white male, that um, you're shining a light on a pathway for me to follow. And it, not only are you casting a beautiful vision, you've also, you've been doing the labor as well, the, the burden and the work. And I think that's what you're talking about is we need uh, more people like me, more male identified people to come and to lift that burden and to carry that burden because it's been survivors who, of uh, systems of oppression who've not only been casting the vision, but doing all the work as well too. So I think that's part of our hope and part of our intent with this conversation is, again, welcome to our kitchen table. We've probably overwhelmed you with a smorgasbord of food. Uh, maybe you've gotten little pieces of flavor here and there. And uh, um, I do apologize. We didn't really get a chance to answer some of your questions. There's been lots of great questions along the way that have been asked in the chat, but we all kind of committed to saying that we're open to hearing from people if you want to contact us. And so the contact will be a part of, of a Google Docs. I know that uh, Sarah has been collecting resources from all of us together to share. So Sarah, I don't know if you want to wrap up by saying something like that. Then we should turn it I, over I, to Jordan. Dude, I'd like to say like, are we like, there are things that were cool to go over. I don't know if you three feel cool to go over a little bit. I I feel like I'd like to hear a little bit more from you, Jude, around your, maybe even just a small bit around the, the forward thinking stuff and even like five minutes of questions, if folks can stick around for another 10. Um, because time, intense time management is colonization is what I'm gonna say as a reason why we ran over. I'm just saying. Let, can I check in with uh, the organizers? I, I know they're kind of behind the they scenes. They just said go for it. Oh, they did. Okay, I, I'm reading the wrong chat, so go for it. All right, I'm going to keep going. You're welcome to stay with us for as long as you can stay. And thank you again. If those of you have to disappear and go to other things, we're just grateful that you're here with us. Um, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up with one or two thoughts, and then we'll take a look at some of the questions. There was one actually that jumped out at me. Uh, maybe I'll... Kate, it's a question around like, how do you engage volunteers? Do you have a hard time getting volunteers uh, um, to come in and do this work? I'm really intrigued to hear more about that because I'm big on like growing movements and inviting people into movements. So maybe you can think about that question while I just share a couple thoughts. I was before this webinar yesterday, I saw this reel. It, it was a hilarious reel on Instagram where somebody's got a bowling ball and they step up to the lane as if they're going to like throw the bowling ball. And instead of throwing the bowling ball from the lane, they like run down beside the lane. And then just as they're in front of the pin, they kind of reach over and launch the bowling ball like towards the pin. And the hilarious part is it's like a clear miss. And I, for me, I was like, that is the classic example metaphor of like the white man trying to lead the social justice movement. And so I, I was thinking about, I have so many times, like especially in my early days, done that thing. And Carol was talking about cookies where I'm getting the cookies. I'm getting all this like, Oh, he's a nice, nice, sweet, kind, caring guy for joining the social justice movement. Look at him. And then I would make a misstep. And some of my colleagues in the feminist movement would be like, you know, when I say the same things as you do, I get called names. And in fact, I often fear for my safety. And for me, that was like a, a real awakening around who should be leading in this work. And so that's why I think I, where I wanted to conclude was there are visionary people doing this work. And there's visionary people that have been doing this work for 
many years since, I mean, even since the onset of slavery and the work of abolition, like a lot of the transformative justice movement has grown out of the work of resisting abolition, abolition and continuing to resist abolition in its current forms through mass incarceration. And so I actually grew up in the white restorative justice movement that, that its origin story uh, is 1974, a particular case near where I'm located now. And I think actually that that has been a process of colonizing what's been happening in Indigenous Black and other movements for long periods of time. And so I think part of this work then too is telling the proper origin stories, learning where this work has come from and making sure that we are appropriately following the lead of, again, people who've been most impacted by oppression. The, the final piece that I wanted to say too, and this is where I really liked hearing from Kate and Sarah about the individual work that they're doing is, Adrienne Marie Brown also talks a lot about fractals and this idea that we got to start somewhere and starting small, we can end up rep replicating and growing bigger and bigger. And sometimes when I hear words like patriarchy and white supremacy and co colonialism, I start to get overwhelmed of like, where do I even begin? And so I think even that individual work that we are doing with men, that's accountability work. And, and my work is so far on the intervention scale. I didn't talk much about it here, but I do post conviction work. I'm working with men uh, who've perpetrated femicide or infanticide and, and they've been incarcerated for 20 or 30 years and it's other family members who want to have dialogue with them. And so I'm so far off the intervention deep end. Um, yet even I still firmly believe that there's little fractals within that that can happen where I'm in relationship with this person and in relationship with survivors and we're working to grieve, as Sarah is saying, or working to heal together. So uh, if the conversation feels overwhelming for you, I firmly believe, like we've said, we can start with ourselves and then we can start with the relationships of where we're at uh, and go from there. So Kate, are you okay answering the question about volunteering? And then maybe there's other questions that have jumped out at, at some of the other people here. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for asking. Um, yeah, Revive works with about um, 30 to 40 volunteers to, to administer the work uh, that's done here. And so we, um, we do have a training coming up in May for our group facilitators, and that is full at this time. So people come because they are survivors who've engaged with the legal system and now are excited about uh, supporting uh, restorative justice. People reach out to us because they're curious about restorative justice and people reach out to us because they have worked with us for years around the harm they've caused and now want to give back to the organization and, and be a part of uh, the next folks' journeys. Um, however, we do dialogue work as well that I mentioned and engage volunteers in that work. And so there is a training coming up in uh, April uh, to become um, yeah, trained in doing this dialogue work. We are looking for folks with uh, a background in restorative justice practices. Uh, we aren't starting from ground zero on what those are. This, this training is an advanced training. Uh, and for, with, for folks who have some understanding on um, gender-based violence and sexual harm, um, so I'll put the link to that training in the, the chat. Uh, if you, there is a cost to that training. If you are taking this training because your intention is to give back to the community um, by volunteering with CJI, we'll reduce that rate because we um, are just are grateful for people who are, who are interested in giving their time that way. Um, yeah, and for folks like, please reach out if, if you are thinking about doing work like this in your community. Um, I'd love to hear from folks uh, about their interest. We, at this time, because it's so rare, our referrals are coming in from Nevada, from Colorado, people in BC are reaching out to do uh, men's accountability work because there is nothing in their community uh, and we aren't funded to do this. So we need more places to do this work. Um, and would I be more than happy to, to send, spend my time with you thinking about how to help that happen. Um, I saw two questions in the chat that are like kind of a bit different versions of the same, of different parts of the same conversation that we often hear. One question was, um, what do you do in cases around accountability when the person who's experienced harm or the survivor doesn't want to participate? And then the other side of that was a different question of what do you do in cases where the person who caused harm is not willing to take accountability or is continuing to cause harm? Um, does anyone, I think those are like really common ones we get around this and so I'm interested if I'll, I can take on one or if someone wants to take on one, folks are excited. Was that 
finger guns. Cool. People can add on uh, wherever. I think the piece around. Okay, I'll start with the survivor piece because it's a little bit more sim it's simpler in some capacities. Um, this is pretty common. Uh, you know, we we are because we work in an institution and now we're like pretty and in, when in, within my institution work, we're pretty kind of known and doing this way. And we actually have a fair amount of like men who come to us saying, hey, my partner or my friend told me that what I did actually was assault and I want to like uh I, I want to not harm someone again. I'm feeling really kind of like fucked up about it, frankly. Um, and so we do that work. And I think my reflection on that, like those parts of the work for me truly come from my, from community accountability work. Uh, accountability doesn't necessarily require the survivor to be like walking alongside every part of that process. Individuals can choose to go through an internal accountability process and, and, and choose to like really reflect on impact, talk to people in their lives, talk to other survivors. Um, and I think that this is part of the piece around realistically, if we're going to try and make these types of work more widespread. It requires all of us to skill up. Not everyone is going to be facilitating restorative justice dialogues and doing accountability work with folks who cause harm, but we all know people who cause sexual harm, period. And so we all do need some level of skilling up, including survivors. Survivors cause sexual harm. Survivors cause other kinds of harm. And so like for the sexual violence counselors out there, you are working with people who cause harm as well. It's not a silo. And so I think like there's a need for across the board, more people relationally in our relationships to be able to have more complicated, caring, humanity-based nuanced conversations um, that like center and recognize that like harm happened and what does accountability look like? What does repair look like? What does it look like to never to ensure you never make this causes harm again is work that can have Happen without the survivor involved and maybe you know figuring out if the survivor wants to be communicated to uh, me and Mingus does a lot of work in, in the Bay um, Area Transformer Justice Collective when they were they're separate now but uh, do a lot of work around pod work and so sometimes there's like an agreement that, that work can go happen over there the survivor doesn't actually want to be involved but maybe there's an understanding about how things can be communicated back if they choose for that information to be shared but the reality is is like as a survivor of trauma myself I'm responsible both in my own experience of trauma and how that can 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 show up in my life and how it can impact my relationships. I'm also responsible when I cause harm, regardless of that person calling me out or telling me to get my shit together. I'm responsible to work on myself. And there's people in our communities that can support us with that. We do not take meaningful accountability in isolation. We don't transform our behaviors in isolation. We require community, we require relationships to do that. Um, so, you know, and the survivor gets to stay mad even if you did an accountability process, I just want to name that. Like they're not, their job is not to forgive you. These processes are not about forgiveness. That is not the goal. Um, yeah, so that's one thought. The other thought um, is around when folks who cause harm aren't willing to take accountability. <sighs> this is really complicated. This could also be a whole friggin' webinar, to be honest. I have a couple different thoughts on that. Uh, one big thought is um, consequences aren't the same as punishment. Um, I'm anti-carceral in my framework. I do not believe in like arbitrary punishment in which like we decided there's enough proof that someone caused harm and then we take away uh, like base liberties um, and access to, to care and services. I believe people who cause harm deserve friends. I deserve people who cause harm deserve to be in, in community, um, but they do face consequences. So if you are not willing to take accountability, then you might be asked not to attend certain spaces. You might be asked to like go work on yourself and there might be people around you who are asking to support you with that. And if you refuse to do that, then those consequences might remain or might grow. And th that's the reality of, of those circumstances. I'm anti uh, like cancel culture um, as a framework. I think there's a lot of nuance there and people make it much too simple. But um, I was actually just in conversation with my colleague, Jasmine Mendoza, who is brilliant. He's a psychologist who's been doing work with folks who cause harm for a very long time. He's currently working actually on a document around gender-based violence uh, risk assessment, specifically within community. He's leaning towards campus with that work, but I think there's some stuff missing. A lot of the risk assessment work is solely looking at intimate partner violence um, for GBV related stuff without a lot of the nuance of how like young people, community, et cetera, goes about itself. And so check out his work, but something he was saying to me around uh, some of the very few people, when we talk about we don't believe in prisons, for, for some of us who don't believe in prisons, 
uh, people always say to us, like, what about the rapists? What about the murderers? What about the psychopaths? You know, and the reality is, A, the number, the, the people who have psychopathy are actually very, very small and they do exist. And I was having a conversation with Jasmine just last week, um, trying to problematize things in our world always. And, you know, he named that when it comes to those particular pieces, even before someone's caused a particular levels of harm, our goal is is uh, actually not to get them into counseling, is not to get them into treatment, is not to do those types of things because that's actually not a system um, that benefits and actually can further tool them in some way to cause more harm. And that's like really can be kind of dangerous to be honest. And so, you know, his, his response to that brilliantly is like, it requires a community response. Community people need to know. We need to be upfront. We need to stop hiding and being in silence about sexual harm. We need to be careful about how we're sharing survivor stories. That is absolutely true. Like what parts of the stories we can share, but like, what does it mean to like surround people and people openly be, be known and it be a, a conversation and the like connection between sexual assault and, and silence and shame around intimacy and sex is like so connected. And so putting things more in the open, um, and one last thing around the work with folks who cause harm, who don't want to participate. Almost all of them don't want to participate at the beginning. Let's be honest. None of us want to be called out and told that we fucked up. None of us do. It feels like crap. I think that a humanity driven approach, almost every survivor I've worked with has been like, this person will not take accountability. They do not want to do that. Almost every time they say that. And almost every time, not every time, but almost every time they get there. And I think that like the approach of shaming them and belittling them and pushing them out does not help us meet the needs. And if our base needs are to support um, and respond to the needs that have emerged from the harm, if we want to like pick those up and try and meaningfully respond to them, it requires us to support people who caused harm um, in taking accountability, which means resourcing them, which means making sure that their mental health is okay, as Carol said. And so I think that it, people often say that over and over again and it actually happens way less in my experience than than people indicate and what does it look like to show up with uh humanity and care um while not colluding and you know i think the biggest thing is that people who do work around accountability we require accountability circles ourselves we require people to keep us in check because these cases are complicated and they, frankly I have multiple right now that are messing with my head. And so it's like, I need people who I can call up, you know, like Kate and be like, bro, what do I do about this case? And yeah, modeling accountability uh, is like a critical part of it. Um, do you folks want to add anything else to that? You're like, no, you're all brilliant. Okay. Was there any other questions that felt really burning that folks wanted to address before we tap out? Sure, if I could just add briefly to what you're saying there, I think most people who've worked with um, people who've been been sort of caught sexually offending will hear them say, "Like I was glad when I was finally it, I was finally caught." I mean, that's not that uncommon, especially I would say with people who've perpetrated child, child sexual abuse in a patterned way. And so often, I mean, this system rarely catches people, but in 6% of cases, then it's the police who stop that behavior, right? In terms of, because other, other people maybe have known and they haven't, et cetera. But what I'm gonna actually do is problematize that and say, we can do better than that. Because what happens after the police get involved then is there's a shift. You will also hear them say that as soon as they start enter into, entering into that system, so maybe the police were that moment where it stops, but then it becomes about denial. And I've heard so many of the men I've worked with talk about it as the denial system, whether it's their lawyer can, trying to talk them into denying what they've done, or it's because whatever agreed upon statement of facts has come up through the courts um, doesn't actually tell the full story or it tells a fa false story or it tells part of the truth but not the whole truth and so then what are they actually potentially pleading guilty to things that they say they didn't do but then they did do some part of it so it gets so convoluted so quickly that it translates into yeah maybe there's moments where that is what stopped the behavior but all that tells me is we need we just need people who are willing to publicly step in and to say like this is not okay you need to stop doing this we need some like community can do that. And I think community can do that in a better way that tends to actually promote accountability. And that's where you're talking about in actual fact where people are denying it's it's sometimes our approach as systems 
that are reinforcing that denial rather than tapping into the humanity of the person. Most people feel ashamed about what they've done when they've hurt somebody else. And so that tells me that people are human beings and that's a pretty normal response to, to causing harm. And so what we actually need to do is create an approach that opens that up rather than causing people to shut down and sort of explain it away because we're about to do violence to them by incarcerating them or whatever else. I just wanted to add that I feel that people are much more accountable to relationships than they are accountable to systems. Like always, I don't, I, you know, culture over policy, just gonna add that. Well, thank you once again, everybody, for joining us, for participating today. I actually hear my kitchen table calling me. It's it's a little past lunch hour where I am. And, and so I think what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Jonathan and to his team. And once again, thank you, Jonathan, for having us here today. Yes, thank you all so much for um, for participating, um, for being our, our esteemed guests um, today. Um, so that you all know, we will. I will uh, send out the the link um, to those who registered, and we'll put it on our Facebook, um, our our social media, um, for the recording of this um, of this webinar, so you all can um, return to it. But um, thank you so much uh, to each of you for um, for for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron for some final announcements. Such deep gratitude to you all, uh, Carol, Kate, Jude, and Sarah for sharing your experiences and reflections and so many levels of depth and complexity that you hold in your work. Um, before we close out, here are the details for the next installation of our webinar series. You're invited to join us again on Wednesday, April 17th uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation on the prison within, the way out is through with guests Sonia Shah, Sujatha Baliga, Catherine Hervey, Aaron Conway, Troy Williams, and Michael Nelson, and host Jonathan Swartz. They'll be sharing insights about the film, The Prison Within. You definitely won't want to miss their conversation. Um, and for those of you who may be in the Northern Virginia area, oh, looks like our slide got a little bit messed up, but um, you can, please, you're invited to join us for the Zare Institute's Restorative Justice Day on April 20th. Uh, happening here on Eastern Mennonite University's campus. It will be a day of sharing practices and ideas across various sectors of restorative justice work. Uh, you can access the registration through that QR code or the registration link that is provided on that slide. Um, again, that's for those of you who are in the Northern Virginia area. Um, and you are also encouraged to check out our website for an extensive archive of webinars and to keep up to date with uh, other resources of the Zare Institute. We're really appreciative of your collaboration and your support. Thank you for joining us and be well. <laughs>